funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with the television licence fee. In the British Army, the highest military honour which can be bestowed on a soldier is the Victoria Cross or VC. In order to win one, a soldier must show extraordinary courage and leadership in the presence of the enemy. During World War I from 1914 to 1918, the Irishman Martin Doyle won a VC fighting in the British Army in France. Yet shortly after that war ended, he became a spy for the Irish Republican Army during the Irish War of Independence, assisting the IRA in its struggle against British rule in Ireland. Now to find out more, I visited New Ross in County Wexford. We're in Mary Street, New Ross, and I'm Parry Grain, and uh, we're standing outside the former house of Martin V.C. Dial, the New Ross man who fought in uh, three armies, uh, fought for the British Army in World War I, the IRA during the War of Independence, and uh, the Irish Free State Army in the Civil War. Uh, Martin was born just outside New Ross, and uh, went on to become a decorated war hero, decorated by the British with the highest honour they could bestow on him from the Victoria Cross. Went on, as I say, to fight for the IRA and ended up in the Free State Army. Uh, a complex man, but a very complex time, but uh, a great Irishman. And as New Ross local historian Porrick Ryan, who is himself a grandnephew of Martin Doyle, just mentioned, Martin Doyle lived a complex life in a very complex time. In many respects, Doyle's story exemplifies the shifting loyalties of Irish people during the turbulent period of 1914 to 1923, when out of the maelstrom of war and revolution, the Irish Free State was born. Ronan McGreevy, military historian and also author of the book Wherever the Firing Line Extends, Ireland and the Western Front. He lived through extraordinary times in the tumult of, of history at that time and he's, he, he really personifies all the different contradictions of Irish identity at that stage. You know, a British war hero who also joins the IRA. He really personifies all the different competing allegiances and loyalties that Irish people had at that time. Martin Dial VC, who in very many ways exemplifies the complexities of the history of the time. Young man who goes off, fights in the British Army, is decorated at the highest level as a result of his actions during the war, comes home to a very changed Ireland, and for a while wondering, I mean, how am I essentially going to fit in to this new Ireland, and then adapts accordingly. Professor Turn Stooley of Maynooth University. This documentary aims to investigate the complex story of Martin Doyle, an Irishman who won a VC military award serving for the British Empire, hence his nickname VC Doyle, yet later joined the IRA in its struggle against that empire. Now, for his contribution to the Irish Freedom Cause, in the year 1941, Doyle was posthumously awarded a War of Independence medal by Eamon de Valera's government. Yet the irony here is that Doyle had fought against Dev's anti-treaty side in the Irish Civil War. New Ross, local historian, Miles Courtney. Martin Doyle, known as VC Doyle among his contemporaries, and a person with, let's face it, a contradictory history. Like he fought for the British Army, came back and joined the IRA, so we could say he was fighting against his former comrades. Then in the Civil War, he was in the Free State Army, which meant that he was fighting against, in theory, fighting against his former comrades, and then joined up with them again into the Irish Army. So there was a lot of anomalies there, so to speak. And it just shows you how complex Irish history is, that you have this individual who was awarded the highest award for gallantry in the British Army and ended up being awarded posthumously in the Irish War of Independence Medal. Military historian Clement Roach. Here's County Wexford historian Des Keeley. The story of Martin Doyle would be just one of many of the shifting loyalties and contradictions of Irish people from the turbulent period of the War of Independence and the Civil War that led eventually to Irish freedom. Martin Doyle is representative of the Irish story of the time. 
Martin Doyle. Yeah, he's a walking contradiction, but so is Irish history. And we'll hear more later about the many contradictions in Martin Doyle's life. But first we need to examine his roots. Martin Doyle was born in a place called Casa, a few miles from New Ross Town in County Wexford, in 1891. At the age of 18, in 1909, he joined the Royal Irish Regiment, Porrick Ryan. Martin Doyle would have been born into a poor farming background, as lots of people were, thousands at the time, uh, weren't too many wealthy farmers. Uh, joined the army, joined it I'd say for a sense of adventure, an income, a sense of adventure, a chance to see the world, a bit of excitement, something different, uh, for want of a better term. Uh, he was proved very apt at being a soldier. He was young, he was extremely fit. So just how common was it for Irishmen to join the British Army during this period? County Wexford historian Celestine Murphy. It was a career, you know, um, pretty much like some members of my family also at that time joined the British Army and, and served in India. And, uh, but, you know, you have to remember that it wasn't a time that was, say, leading up to 1916 or, um, and a lot of them, it was the best possible career for them because uh, they were fed and paid and they saw the world. Maybe your only chance to escape the grind was to join the army. The only ar army that was available to them was the British army. And there was Irish regiments and, 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 and you, you had this esprit de corps and, and this, you know, sort of, of you joining your local regiment. Military historian Gerard Whelan. And as was mentioned already, the local regiment which Martin Doyle joined was the Royal Irish Regiment, whose home depot was in Clonmel, County Tipperary, and which recruited largely from counties Kilkenny, Wexford, Watford and Tipperary. So what kind of initial training would Martin Doyle have undergone in the army? Military historian Clement Roach. Basic training was the usual foot drill, rifle drill, your physical education, um, possibly a little bit of education in it. They wanted to see if you could read or write it, possibly, and that sort of thing. Um, so he did that. More than likely he did it probably for 26 weeks, which is regular army training today, between four and six months. And then he would have been dispatched to where he was needed. So either battalion, first or second, of the Royal Irish Regiment, wherever he was needed. So he would have been this batch to the second battalion and the reason why we know this is in 1911 the second battalion was in Fort George in Guernsey and doing a bit of research for yourself I was able to place him with the second battalion in Guernsey so he was there probably um, in 1910 after that then because his service record does not exist um, it was probably destroyed um, in the in nineteen forty in the the Blitz, um, we we have to patch together then from various sources. So by nineteen twelve thirteen he was serving with the first battalion out in India. Martin Dyle served in India, uh, was a boxing champion in his battalion. Porik Ryan, and uh, a strange thing, but he actually won an elephant in a, in a raffle in India. An elephant? An elephant, which is a strange thing, but maybe not as strange as we think. Uh, it might be the equivalent to winning a tractor nowadays. Elephants in those days in India were work animals. Worked for agriculture, felling forests, pulling loads, everything else that goes with it. So it was probably quite a good prize, not a, a booby prize. In August 1914, the First World War breaks out. And now with the outbreak of war, Martin Doyle's life was radically changed. Ronan McGreevy. The First World War it transforms his life as well as the lives of practically everybody on the island of Ireland. And he's transferred to the Royal Dublin Fusiliers 
we're not sure the circumstances, but that was typical and very, very common at the time where in the rush to get men out to the front, uh, some battalions had a surfeit of officers, others battalions didn't have enough officers, so uh, he would have been transferred to the Royal Dublin Fusiliers simply, I suspect, because they, they probably didn't have enough experienced men like him, even though he had only been in the army for five years. So he went to France with his new regiment in December 1914, Served in some of the early campaigns and he was promoted to sergeant in 1916. Um, what war records we have of his, and they most of them were destroyed in the, the fire during the Second World War, would suggest that he must have behaved capably and he probably wasn't injured, but we don't really know uh, right, too much so about that so we're kind of, you know, based on evidential trail, he was out there anyway, somewhere on the Western Front, seeing action, and what would it have been like, Ronan? It would have been an absolute hellscape. I mean, he would have probably have done three or four two tours of duty. Uh, we know that the Royal Dublin Fusiliers was decimated, both battalions, during the um, Second Battle of Ypres in April and May 1915, when the Germans used poison gas. So I'd imagine by 1916 he had already had a belly full of war. The trenches in France. Can any of us really imagine what it must have been like? Day after day, we all know about the mud, the trench foot, the conditions, the rats, let alone the wounded, the insane, uh, battle men over the top, blow the whistle over the top, walk towards your enemy. I mean, if you wanted to make up a horror story, I don't think you could make up one any worse than what those men did endure. And I don't just mean Irish men or Martin Dial, everybody. And it was on both sides. Porrick Ryan. Here's County X for the historian Bernard Brown. On the Western Front. Martin Doyle, he certainly would have witnessed all the new technologies that were used in the Great War. Things that had never happened before. You had the use of chlorine gas. Uh, uh, you had flamethrowers being used for the first time. And you had tanks, which came a little bit later. Uh, uh, the British first introduced them. Uh, and then you had aeroplanes. Uh, you had, of course, the machine gun, the Vickers machine gun the British used. And the, the machine gun units that were set up by the German uh, forces at that time had a huge and devastating impact on the troops. as was touched on earlier in this programme. Because most of Martin Doyle's military files were destroyed during the Blitz in World War II, it's virtually impossible for historians to know where and when exactly he fought in France during the first three years of the war. However, that said, historians know that he saw action on the Western Front. Also, he likely trained recruits in his role as a sergeant in the Royal Dublin Fusiliers. So what were the challenges in training recruits? Military historian John Goodman. One of the things is, is obviously the, the basic discipline that they have to learn how to operate as a unit, just to move together, stay together. And then there's all the other stuff that goes with that, you know, the keeping their weapons clean and serviceable, the stuff that you have to be able to do. That's the day-to-day barrack stuff. So there's that part of it, to follow orders, to keep that discipline. But then it's also you have to teach them, you have to lead them. So that when the first artillery shell comes in, they don't run. That you hold, you know, to keep that bravery, that you provide that example, um, that the men can look up to you. Uh, and obviously, he, Martin Doyle, he's done that because he wouldn't have, you know, w- what happened in, in subsequent actions, he's, he's still got those guys behind him. It gives, some someone like him then would give confidence to those troops coming up that, you know, okay, this is bad, but we'll be okay. The Sarge says it's okay, so... Uh, they keep going like that and then it's also how to teach them how to fight effectively because the officers will be saying right we're going to take this objective we'll do this we'll do this he's the one telling them how to do it you know don't cut your wire this way you know how to cut the wire don't use a grenade like this use this type of bullet for this i mean there was a lot of little things that were learned in the trenches um small things that typically a lot of came from things that are the the, the difference between life and death totally and he's doing that you know he's the one providing that example and also the guidance as well and 
I'm sure as well with some of the younger guys, probably possibly the shoulder to cry on, even though it was a very kind of macho manly type of thing. You didn't show fear or whatever, but enough just to, to you know, to squeeze on the shoulder, take it easy, son, a little word like that. It's it's that kind of stuff to keeping them alive as much as making them an effective soldier. You know, that that's half the battle experience comes if you can keep them alive. So he would have had a huge job with that. And aside from training others, Martin Doyle was also in the thick of the fighting. Indeed, so much so that in March 1918, he showed such valour that he was later awarded the military medal for his courage in capturing a barn held by a German gun crew, Ronan McGreevy. Just to put it in in its uh, perspective here, um, he's serving in the 1st Royal Dublin Fusiliers, which is part of the 16th Irish Division. on the on the 21st of March, the Germans begin the spring offensive, which is to try and break the stalemate on the Western Front, which has been there for more than three and a half years. They succeed in doing that, and they drive the British and French all the way back to Amiens, which is a distance of 50 miles, which is a huge amount of territory in the context of the First World War. Um, one of the divisions that gets hit the hardest is the 16th Irish Division. Um, they, uh, in the in the space of the two weeks that they are involved in the German Spring Offensive, they suffer 7,000 casualties and there's more than 1,000 dead. And um, one of their officers said, uh, you know, the division has ceased to exist, wiped off the map. They took the Bosch attack full smack the first day they were in the trenches. So... In the context of this, uh, Doyle wins his, his military medal by capturing a barn held by a German gun crew on the 24th of March 1918. So this is three days after the German spring offensive begins. He says that uh, we had to cross about a thousand yards of open country exposed to terrible shell and machine gun fire. The casualties very heavy. Having reached the trench we found that the Germans were dug in not more than 40 yards ahead of us. A big barn stood in the grounds between us and a fight ensured to take possession of it. On the enemy side there was long grass which afforded them cover and a machine gun party succeeded in creeping out and capturing the ruin and they set up a big fire and Doyle goes on to say I called for volunteers and went over the top of the charge when I reached the barn I was alone so he's alone in the barn and he bayoneted the two Germans that were there seized the machine gun and took possession of the barn so that's an extraordinary act of bravery on his own probably may may well have merited the Victoria Cross but there's certain um, criteria that have to be fulfilled to win the Victoria Cross including one that your superior officer has to witness the act of bravery so in this case um, what he did uh, he did on his own so he won the military medal which in itself was extraordinary and then he's captured uh, in the uh, the German uh, spring offensive he becomes a prisoner of war and then you think his war is over but then the British start taking back the territory that the Germans have taken over from them. The Germans have overrun their supply lines. So on the April the 8th, 1918, the counter-offensive begins and it pushes the Germans back a considerable distance. And of course, the Germans turn and flee in a lot of cases and leave the prisoners of war behind them. So as it turns out, here's Doyle. He thinks his war is over and he's back in again. Not only was Martin Doyle still in the war, but a short while later in April 1918, he was transferred from the Royal Dublin Fusiliers to the Royal Munster Fusiliers. A few months later in August 1918, Doyle was promoted to Acting Company Sergeant Major just days before the actions on the 2nd of September 1918 near Rheincourt in France, which resulted in him being awarded the Victoria Cross, Porrick Ryan. He ended up being awarded the Victoria Cross. He captured a tank, he rescued officers, he uh, captured prisoners, he uh, destroyed an enemy machine gun post, all single-handedly. And here is military historian Clement Roach, Quoting from a 1919 article from the County Wexford newspaper, The Free Press, about Martin Doyle's Victoria Cross actions. This is, again, in Martin's own words, um, when he came home. Um, you told him to report our local yeah, reporter. He, he, yeah, he was uh, speaking to a local reporter. So he said, like, this is the 2nd of September. They were advancing at Herald's Court, um, captured a number of trenches, 
I, when I saw one of our tanks in difficulties ahead of us, I went forward to do what I could to save it and rescue the crew. Found the majority of the crew were wounded and the tank was lying over in a battered trench uh, within the German lines. The enemy shouted back at us to surrender. I consulted the tank officer and told him the best thing to do was to fight forward. I had no weapon of any kind at the time and I pulled the Hoskis gun out of the tank, built up a barricade and turned it on the enemy. I got one of the wounded crew out of the tank and put him in charge of the gun while I went down to search the trench. I had gone about 20 yards when I met a German officer with a machine gun under his arm. He shouted to me in English, hands up. I shot him through the chest with a revolver that I had taken from the tank. I then went down the trench by the way he come, picking up a rifle and bayonet on the way. And I came on the machine gun crew that he had commanded. I bayoneted three out of four Germans and then went back to the tank. It was on fire and the enemy was swarming around and threatening to take the whole lot of us prisoner. A sergeant who was in the tank was badly wounded and I got him on my back and carried him to safety. That's all I think. But that wasn't all. Later in the day when the Germans counterattacked Martin Doyle's position, he drove back the enemy and captured many prisoners. Now Clement Roach also had this to say about Martin Doyle saving a tank crew. You can see his leadership in it. You can see his thinking and turn of mind on what he had to do to save that crew with that tank. Um, he was very quick off the mark to be able to grab a machine gun and to put it in a position to defend the tank, defend the crew, and then be able to quick think and write him under severe pressure and go down the trench and see what he could do down the trench. The chances were he might not come back from down that trench, but he was able to do what he um, he's probably set out to do which was to make sure that the machine gun that was giving them problems wasn't going to hinder his evacuation of those troops and again he did it all single handedly And concerning Martin Doyle carrying a badly wounded man to safety Ronan McGreevy had this pertinent comment to make him carrying a man to safety. Uh, remember, he was only five foot six, and I think he was about 129, 130 pounds, which is what less than ten stone. I mean, it's it's just beggar's belief that a guy could do all the things that he did. But as I said to you, the the Victoria Cross is only awarded when there is a senior officer who can vouch for a man's courage. So, so there was case, a senior officer there at the time. Yeah. He witnessed it and yeah. that's why he got it. Yeah, and I think it may well have been the, the tank officer who would have been in that tank who would have witnessed his courage. So. Now, one of the things with the VC, as opposed to the other medals, one of the, the qualifying factors is it has to have an outcome on the battle. It's not just about an, an act of gallantry, you know, to take so many prisoners or kill so many men or save so many men. It actually has to have an effect on the outcome of the battle. Military historian John Goodman. So the fact that he gets the tank through, or gets that, you know, it keeps that in action, that is probably... The qualifying factor from, say, the DCM or a, another military medal, a bar on his military medal to actually get into VC, is that it has an impact on the outcome of the actual battle. So just what is the significance of the Victoria Cross or VC award, Clement Roach? The Victoria Cross is the highest award for gallantry in the British and Commonwealth forces. And for something that's insignificant because all it is is a piece of bronze that's cast from Russian cannons that were captured after the the, the Crimean War. The, there's no value in the medal itself as in monetary value as it's just a piece of scrap metal. Um, but yet yeah, it's the gallantry story behind these awards that is, makes these this significant. Well, the Victoria Cross is the highest honour for gallantry in the British Army. There is no higher honour. And it is, I think, a universal honour. So some, some, especially in the sort of hierarchical system of the British Army in the First World War, even the Second, um, officers would have got the military cross, whereas non-commissioned officers or privates would have got the military medal. But the Victoria Cross was open to everybody. And 
There was over 600 given in the uh, First World War, but that's out of an army of more than 6 million. So you're looking at one man in 10,000 winning, I think, if my maths serves me correctly. And I think there's only been two given this century. So it's the biggest deal. And everybody knows that. I mean, for instance, if you try to buy a Victoria Cross now, you won't get one for less than a quarter of a million euro. Wow, uh, yeah. a quarter of a but, million. But, but, but there was a record set for uh, Victoria Cross, and it was, again, involving another Irishman, a man named Thomas Kavanagh, who was a civilian and won the Victoria Cross in 1856-57. I, I forget the date, but all I, I do remember that the actual medal itself went for £950,000 sterling at auction, which is more than a million euros. So, I mean, these medals are very rare. Ronan McGreevy. Here's John Goodman once again. Anyone that won the VC, it's an, it's an incredible feat. They, didn't, they don't give these things out. I think there's only 1,500 in total have been awarded since it was instituted. And that's true First World War, Second World War, you know, Korea, some of Vietnam, the Falklands all of those conflicts. Martin Dyle, young Irish man, joined the British Army and ended up being awarded the Victoria Cross. The Wexford man became one of only 27 Irish men born in what is now the Republic to be awarded the Victoria Cross in the course of World War I. It's an incredible feat of arms for one man and totally deserving of his VC. You cannot get any higher than the Victoria Cross. To get a VC is a huge thing. The First World War began in August 1914 and eventually came to an end over four years later in November 1918. Now, the Ireland which Martin Doyle returned to in 1919 after the war was very different from the country at the start of the war, primarily due to the 1916 rising and the rise of militant Irish nationalism. So just how changed was Ireland? County Wexford historian Monica Crofton. Shun everything British was the idea. Shun everything British. Uh, The change was huge. In Wexford, gradual in other places, much quicker. The big, big mistake of the British government, we know this, was killing the rebels, Parik Pearson Company, and that brought this huge swell and this huge change of opinion. So these young men came back two years after the rebellion, two years after the executions. They came back to a country where they kind of expected some sort of a good, maybe not a hero's welcome, but a warm welcome, only to find that no, Because things were being shunned that were British, they were shunning those who wore the British uniform. Yet despite this change, nevertheless the town of Neuros had no qualms in celebrating the return of its Victoria Cross hero, Martin Doyle, in March 1919. Leighton Thomas, who is himself a great-grandnephew of Martin Doyle. Martin Doyle came home then to a totally different Ireland. Um, Ireland at the time then was fighting for its independence from Britain. And... Not many, I suppose, of the soldiers who came home at that time would have been welcomed back or or seen in in such great uh, honour because they were fighting for the British Army. But Martin Doyle came home to a hero's welcome um, where there were crowds waiting at the train station for him and he was met by his mother and father. And as they came across uh, into the town then, there was bugles playing, there was banners up uh, welcoming the hero home to New Ross. Um, So he definitely came home to a completely different reception based on his achievements, I, I suppose, in the World War, yeah. And I suppose kind of it was, you know, the, our, the local boy made good and, uh, look, he's one of our own and we're, we're proud of this a local a hero. Yes. So, I guess New Ross didn't turn his back on on people that came from New Ross. You know, they, they saw them as heroes, they welcomed them back. Martin Dial came home to a hero's welcome in New Ross in particular, uh, there were banners out, the bands played. He was a welcome home, our hero. Porrick Ryan. But uh, Martin Dial wasn't one to sit down, and it's only now that his, his life had been interesting up to this, but now it starts to get very interesting. Because what does Martin do, along with thousands of other men, he joins what we refer to as the old IRA. <laughs> Around November 1919, 
Martin Doyle joined the Irish Republican Army, working as an IRA intelligence officer or spy in the British Army garrison in Ennis, County Clare. So what do historians know about his IRA service during the Irish War of Independence, which lasted from 1919 to 1921? Military historian Clement Roach. We have to look at the Irish archives. So we look at the military archives and we do pick up some hints of him being involved in the IRA. Now there's two men who certified Martin Doyle's involvement as an intelligence officer, basically, in his role um, during the War of Independence, down in Clare. And those two men who certified as to Martin Doyle's role in the IRA during the Irish War of Independence were former IRA personnel Patrick McMahon and Joe Barrett. The first portion of Patrick McMahon's certificate dated the 6th of December 1935 goes as follows. To whom it may concern... This is to certify that Sergeant Doyle of D Company, 2nd Battalion, Portobello, Dublin, later Sergeant Major Doyle, stationed at home barracks Ennis in the years 1920-21, worked and done everything possible for the IRA during the years 1920-21. And here is a portion of a testimonial letter, which Patrick McMahon also wrote to the Irish government authorities in December 1935. He advanced all sorts of arguments to prove why he should leave the home with his rifle and go to the hills. But rightly or wrongly, I succeeded in convincing him that he was more useful inside the British barracks at the time, notwithstanding that both of us were appreciative of his position, which was looked upon with suspicion at the time. At my request, he went to Kilrush on another occasion, for the purpose of establishing an intelligence connection and so on there but I think he got well out of the mess that I had him almost walked into due to acting prematurely on unreliable information. He supplied small arms and ammunition occasionally, and I always felt that two true Irishmen were inside the British garrison in himself and Sergeant Murphy. And there's also from Joseph Barrett, who was uh, also a captain in the IRA in that period, who gives, again, a light into him being an intelligence officer for the IRA. What does Joseph Barrett say in his certificate for Doyle's Mm. activities Uh, for the IRA? He basically says, um, if I read from what we have here, uh, Martin Doyle gave very valuable assistance to the IRA and NS during 2021. Later in Kerry where he got in touch with J.J. She through a brother of mine who was a Christian brother there at the time. Again, I'd say he proved himself a good Irishman. Um, so you can see exactly he knew the connections to the local units at the time. So, yes, he had to be involved. Now, the clincher is to this is he was awarded the War of Independence Medal. Martin Doyle was posthumously awarded the War of Independence Medal by the Irish government in 1941 for his contribution to the Irish freedom struggle. Clement Roach. Being awarded the War of Independence Medal, he had to be certified for that medal. And it was it was one of the hardest things that they did back then. They had to make sure everyone and across the T's and dotted the I's for those medals. But yet he had some role in the War of Independence. So what role exactly? Ronan McGreevy. From what we know, he served uh, as an intelligence officer in the Clare IRA where he would have probably have been spying on the barracks in Ennis and he would have probably have removed weapons from the barracks wherever he could to give to the IRA. Due to the covert nature of spying, it's virtually impossible for historians to know the full extent of Martin Doyle's role as an IRA intelligence officer during the Irish War of Independence. However, most historians agree that the so-called Battle of Intelligence was a crucial part of the overall conflict. Military historian John Goodman. Intelligence was everything in that war. As, as Michael Collins proved, I mean, it was a war of intelligence. You know who the guys are. You you find out where they are. You know when to hit them because 
like it's a David and Goliath type of struggle. You're, you know, you're not going to go toe to toe with these guys militarily. So Martin Doyle, his role is going to be massive. It's you know what strengths are here, who's the commanding officers, uh, what are they like, are they aggressive? You know, and he'd understand all of that. He'd know from his experience of the different officers, are they capable? Who's not capable? Who's lazy? Who's slovenly? What is the attitude of the troops in the barracks as well? Like, are they lazy? Are they drinking? All that kind of stuff, you know, are they physically fit? What's the best time to hit them? You know, are they how many fresh troops have they got in? Inexperienced troops, are they inexperienced? All of that stuff constantly feeding in, and then not not to mention more, which is huge as well. If he's sneaking arms out, that's critical because you know that was one of the biggest problems that the, the IRA had was actually getting a decent supply of arms. Out. Um, so his role is probably far more valuable in what he could supply from an intelligence point of view than he would have been out leading the column out in the field somewhere. Well, the battle of intelligence is absolutely critical, as we know. It was the first time, I think, that the Irish, the IRA, had better intelligence than the British. Ronan McGreevy. Here is military historian James Taylor. The Achilles heel of the British in Ireland was that their civil servants and most of their military and police were Irish. And once you lost their loyalty, they were a fifth column in your back garden. In any military situation, intelligence is vital. You have to know what's going on, what's going to happen. Intelligence was the major factor in this war. The Anglo-Irish Treaty of December 1921 resulted in the establishment of an Irish Free State. In the subsequent Irish Civil War, which lasted from June 1922 to May 1923, Martin Doyle fought in the pro-treaty National Army, Porrick Ryan. We had a civil war situation in the country where we had people who accepted the treaty, Free Staters, and we had people who didn't accept it, now claiming the old IRA, and Martin Doyle went with what we termed or became known as the Free Staters. He actually joined the Free State Army and went on to serve in the Free State Army and in another irony of his life went on then to, to fight people that he had previously sided with, as in, i.e. World War I, he was on the British side. Irish War of Independence, he fought the British. Now we have him fighting what became the IRA as a Free Stater in the Free State Army. And it was while serving with the Free State Army during the Irish Civil War that Martin Doyle was shot in the hand. Fortunately, he recovered from the wound. Historian Ronan McGreevy. Here's a guy who comes through the First World War basically unscathed and he was injured during the Civil War. So he would have been one of these former British Army officers who would have buttressed the National Army and would have been really, really critical. Their experience was really critical in helping to win the Civil War for the government side. After the Irish Civil War ended in May 1923, Martin Doyle served with the 2nd and 20th Infantry Battalions and also the School of Instruction in the regular Irish Army until 1937. Now, soldiers with Doyle's experience were hugely beneficial to the new state's army. County Wexford historian Bernard Brown. He was of huge value to the National Army because of his expertise in the use of weapons like the Vickers machine gun and other types of weapons. And he was, by all accounts, a brilliant instructor in the army and uh, one that the men would have looked up to as well because of his prior military career. After many years of soldiering, Martin Doyle eventually retired from the Irish Army in 1937, while remaining a reservist. Now, For the final few years of his life, he worked in Guinness Brewery in Dublin. New Ross local historian Miles Courtney. When he finished up, he got one of the greatest jobs that any Irish man could ever aspire to, and that's as a security officer in Guinness Brewery. But like sure, the poor man then contracted polio and passed away at a very early age. Indeed, Martin Doyle died from polio in December 1940, aged 49, 
leaving behind a wife and three daughters. He was subsequently buried in Grange Gorman Military Cemetery in Dublin. Leighton Thomas. Well, Martin Doyle is buried in Grange Gorman. It's a British uh, cemetery, but he was buried there and the headstone was actually erected by his comrades. So the, the headstone is unusual in that it's probably the only headstone for a Victoria Cross winner that doesn't have the Victoria Cross symbol on the headstone. Um, I guess the reason being that the British didn't uh, pay for his headstone. It was his own comrades who afforded him that privilege of putting the headstone up for him. Martin Doyle wouldn't have been wealthy by any sense of the means at all. Like, And it's one of the reasons why he took the job in Guinness Brewery was because it paid more than the army did and to try and better his lives. He had children to bring up at the time. So I guess, uh, in a sense, it, it, it sort of makes sense why his comrades paid for his, uh, his headstone at the time because the money wouldn't have been there for it otherwise, you know. And perhaps it's not surprising that Martin Doyle's former comrade stood by Doyle's family when he died. For Martin Doyle was renowned for inculcating a band of brothers mentality in his comrades. In a nutshell, he was what's termed a soldier's soldier, Bernard Brown. Martin Doyle would have been deemed to be a soldier's soldier. And he would have been somebody that you would want by your side in terms of leading a squad out. This was the sort of man who you took your orders from and that you believed in. Martin Doyle, he had your back. You know, any time you could depend on him. And if he was beside you in the trenches... You know, you could depend on him. You'd never have to go looking for him. He was always there. Miles Courtney. Here's John Goodman. His loyalty to his troops is obvious. Um, from this, you know, the amount of men, wounded men that he rescued, s- saving his men from being killed and saving his other comrades, even rescuing an officer. Uh, so from that point of view, he obviously have huge courage, personal courage and integrity. If you were in trouble and you needed someone in your corner, I think Martin Dyle is the man you would turn to. Porrick Ryan. Would he endanger you? No. Would he help you? Yes. Could he read a situation? Absolutely he could. An all-round professional soldier. Everything he did was from a military point of view. All dramatic narrations in this documentary were done by Brian McMahon. Over the course of this documentary, we've highlighted the story of Martin Doyle, an Irish man who served in three armies, the British Army, the Irish Republican Army and also the Irish Free State Army. So what's the big lesson we can learn from Martin Doyle's life? Clement Roach. It just shows you how complex uh, Irish history is, that you have this individual who was awarded the highest award for gallantry in the British Army, and ended up being awarded posthumously the Irish War of Independence Medal. Martin Doyle, he's nearly a personification of the whole period that fought in the First World War, came back, fought against those he'd been fighting with and then fought against those he was fighting with again and then went on to die of a, a disease that really you know, reflected as much of what was going on socially in Ireland that so many people got polio and died of polio uh, as much as anything else. John Goodman. Here's Miles Courtney. He served in three different armies in conflict with each other, one might say, but certainly it depicts the complexities of Irish history. As we say, it's never black and white, but always complex. Martin Doyle, he was a proud Irishman who he fought for this country undercover and he would have liked to have won his Victoria Cross for Ireland. But, of course... As a political entity, that didn't exist at the time. So when the Great War did start, uh, only the British Army existed. And so he had to join the only army that was available at the time in this country. And uh, But he, he went and fought as an Irishman. He came home, he fought as an Irishman. And he died as an Irishman, still part of the Reserve Army for Ireland. So I believe Martin Doyle gave everything he could for this country. Leighton Thomas. Here's Bernard Brown. Martin Doyle, he was an exemplary soldier and he's somebody that certainly deserves to be remembered for his bravery, for his leadership, 
and he was just a great Wexfordian. Funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with the television licence fee.